Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Solomon Hatcher. I'm a graduate student here in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Today I'll be talking to you about convolutional neural networks. One of the main things that I thought about when I started uh, developing this lecture was I needed something to really capture the essence of convolutional neural networks in one image. Couldn't find that one image except for a bunch of convolutional neural networks. So on this front page you see it's just a brain with a bunch of sparkly things coming out of it. So in a sense there is somewhat of a connection since convolutional neural networks are biologically inspired. Um, but it has really no deep connection. You, you look at the brain and, you, and it's a very complicated system. And the convolutional neural networks by comparison are relatively toyish. So, but why uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the motivation and inspiration behind it, a little bit more detail in the function of it. But first, let's move on to a little bit of what has been happening recently with convolutional neural networks and why they are seemingly on, a, on the rise. Um, this is the ImageNet large scale visual recognition competition results from the last few years. Um, now, the ImageNet competition, you have a, a, a database of roughly 1 million images, I believe, with 1,000 classes. Um, this is where the likes of Google and anyone else developing cutting edge architectures and convolutional networks go to test their models. And this is a very robust test. So um, before the onset of convolutional neural networks, at least in this competition, um, they use classical models or shallow uh, networks a little bit. A little bit further back in time, you would see more classical models that didn't utilize neural networks. But in this case, in 2010 and 2011, they did. But you can see their classification error or top five error since they have a, um, the prediction is on five objects, whichever one it had the greatest prediction on it presents. It was 28 and 26 percent, respectively. I guess for the competition up to that point, it was very good until um, 2012 came along and AlexNet just stumped the competition. 16 percent um, classification error, which is outstanding. And nowhere near human um, classification error, but with ZFNet uh, the next year, you can start seeing a trend. Um, this thing, convolutional neural networks, which had been disregarded in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s as hogwash and something that's not going to amount to anything except for object uh, character recognition, is suddenly on the rise. Yan uh, um, LeCun, who with um, um, Yashua Beningio uh, uh, developed um, um, Lynette 5, which was out of AT&T Bell's labs in the 80s. Well, Lynette 5 came in the 90s. Lynette, the original version of his um, uh, convolutional network came out in the 80s, late 70s. And it was basically to do one job, and that was to recognize handwritten digits. It did it very well. And so when Lynette 5, which came out in uh, 1998, um, it did 10% of all, it did the object character recognition on 10% of all checks in the United States at that time. So it was, it only had um, 80 out of every 10,000 uh, prediction had 83 errors. He actually posts the 83 errors in his paper and humans would be able to recognize that there are numbers, but the machine had problems. Nowadays, uh, UNET is a toy database. It's a toy data set, excuse me. And you can get classification error in the tens, tens of thousands of a percent, very well above what a human could uh, classify. Um, you can see the trend. First of all, there's a trend of classification error going dramatically down. And the yeah. last three, GooglyNet, ResNet, and um, CU Image, are radically different architectures. And they had ra radically different improvements in um, classification error. Um, AlexNet was very simple. is ba based a little bit off of um, Lynette 5 from the late 90s. It also was the first architecture to uh, efficiently use GPUs. Um, this is the era of N NVIDIA GeForce 500 series GPUs. So, um, 
Google Net, though, is one of the amazing uh, architectures on here. ResNet is extraordinary. But you can also see the number of layers increases. And we're going to talk about the depth of a neural network, the number of layers it has. That's the number of convolutional layers or alternating convolution, ReLU, pooling. When we get into the discussion about what a convolution layer is, uh, what is a pooling layer, what do they do, do, and how do they affect the system. But an AlexNet had eight layers. It had two streams because it had, to, at that point, GPUs didn't have enough memory, so it ran off of two streams, two GPUs, so you had to divide it. So if you ever look at the um, graphic that describes the architecture of AlexNet, which I should have provided for you, sorry. Um, you'll see it's cut off, and for some reason they had a problem. When they published the paper, they cut off half the graphic, so everyone ever, who's always showed that image is cut off at the top. But it's very easy to follow if you have a few basic, um, um, a, a little bit of knowledge on how to actually um, know what goes into architecture, the size of each layer, the size of convolution kernels, and stuff like that. But, um, it doesn't show a 2017 result, which is, as you probably would guess, is still on a trend. It's a little bit lower than 3%. As, um, I forgot the name of the, the team that won that. Um, on this list, the most used is VGG. It's, it's slower than um, ResNet, even though it's a smaller network. As you can see, VGG has 19 layers, ResNet has 100, amazing 152 layers. Um, ResNet does some nifty things to actually get more speed with a very much larger network. Um, the thing that Googling Net really introduced into this is got, it got rid of the fully connected network at the end. And I will go into it a little bit more. It's vastly interesting. Um, so let's give a little background. I just what? have a question yes. about uh, the history of that thing. Yes. So everybody's comparing that to human error and they say that now it's better than human error. Mm -hmm. Now, how they know that this is human error ah, compared to what? On ImageNet, they actually had a human sit down and go through and try to classify every single image. And they, uh, well, but, they had many humans But do how that. they know that this is actually error? How do you know it's error? Um, um, what is what the I, ground truth? What is the ground truth? Yes, how has they know the ground truth <laughs> if humans cannot identify it? That is a conundrum. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, in uh, the paper describing the method, is that um, when they had they use an when when you use many humans, they use the same thing. when you train some convolutional networks, it's called an ensemble. So an ensemble of humans usually reduces the human error by about two percent, even though they <laughs> didn't do it. In, that's kind of a joke, but yeah. It's, anyway, but um, uh, the, the way they did it is that they ensembled humans and then they averaged their predictions and um, you had an image of a cow if so, I, I if I remember correctly if they misidentify that it's a cow somehow it may be a very distorted image and they said oh it's a cow when it's really a horse I counted against it I counted as so um, they actually distorted known images yes to show some horrible yeah thoughts. yeah um, I don't know how any Human, unless they have never encountered something very simple, it might be some things in the data set that are very hard, harder than other things to classify. I don't know what exactly those things are. I've looked at the classes. They don't seem to be that. But um, y'all remember, uh, well, there was only one of you at the MATLAB conference the other week. When, he, there was a mat, when the MATLAB came out, so, uh, MathWorks, they talked about the same thing. They trained their own data set with trying to recognize salads. They pre, they um, they tuned a pre-trained VGG network that was trained on ImageNet, and they had a bunch of people at the office take pictures of salads. Now, a salad looks like a salad. You can recognize it. But some people at math, uh, MathWorks tried to fool the network so because it was supposed to recognize salads and fries. So they took some carrots and made them look like fries, and they had some greenery behind, greenery behind it. So its prediction on that was kind of way off. It predicted as fries or something. So there's some... Um, some effort that can go into it, so uh, a human can be full. So if you uh, uh, can feed them so data, kind of in, what, what I'm trying to say is uh -huh. most intentional misleading of humans. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm thinking so. Yes, the misleading object knew what was that. I believe so. I believe there was some intentional because misleading. Otherwise, you cannot say like what you compare it to. Like yeah. what is human error? Like you can compare like average human error uh, compared to ground truth. But then you need to have ground truth, which says, like, I'm what thinking is really? That's because if you compare, thing. for example, for numbers, like, you have that means database with uh, handwritten numbers. Right. Maybe some of those numbers, you extend it that with other handwritten numbers. Mm -hmm. 
and only the person who writes the number knows what it is. Yeah, in some cases because that would be humans true. clearly could be fooled compared to the opinion of the person who wrote it. Right. But is that like the person's opinion, what they wrote, or maybe they just wrote the wrong number and they just That's true. what they wrote. Maybe they wrote five and it was looking like three or something like right, that. Right, right. So, some of the state-of-the-art networks on MNIST, the hardest problems in that data set are numbers that look completely unlike what you would think a nine looks, an eight looks like a nine, completely and utterly, and human would be confused by that, and the network is confused by that. It's just the person who wrote that number is kind of, yeah, they could have had a bad day, they or the pen could have been leaking, who knows? But in the regards to classifying the human error in the ImageNet data set, I think they use an ensemble, a lot of humans watching a lot of images, and they kind of average the error across all of those somehow. I would have to look at the uh, actual go and look back at MNIST and find out the details on that. But to go deeper into the history of neural networks, see, at least the uh, inspiration, um, but before I get to that, what we're going to be talking about today is the anatomy of a CNN. We're going to look at this architecture, what makes it up, what is a basic, very basic convolutional neural network. We're going to have um, talk about convolution, convolutional and pooling layers, which are the most fundamental components of a um, convolutional network, and we're going to look at the state of the art. A few uh, networks as they have evolved since the likes of Lacoon, I mean, not Lacoon, but uh, Lynette 5 and AlexNet, and what we're looking at a sample, a small, small sample of things you can look forward to today. Um, there are, it's, it's exploding. Um, so, what, where did the inspiration for a convolutional network come from? Basically, cat brains. Um, a paper by Hubble and Weasel, uh, uh, they did a, there are a couple of neuroscientists, they did a study um, on cats, they hooked up some electrodes to the cat's occipital lobe, and they showed them images of edges and very basic shapes, and they actually um, registered the activations of their neurons as they were looking at these shapes to try to understand how they 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 recognized how how in their mind, in their brain they built up these um, notions of objects in the world from starting from very fundamental objects and they found is a hierarchical kind of uh, relationship so it, the image um, they have first of all they discovered that the cats and later on we. Um, expanded to primates and other animals that they have a, something called a receptive field. Um, a receptive field is basically where you're focusing your gaze. It's almost like if you take a flashlight and shine it on the wall, the cone of the light is where your gaze is going to be. The edge where it's blurring off is the is um, um, peripheral vision until you cannot see anything like to the size of your face. But one thing that's different, um, they, which I'm jumping ahead, but Going back to this, as you can see, um, looking at the hierarchy features is very, very telling. You can say that the uh, visual acuity begins with recognition of very fine features like edges. Then you go up to something like edges and corners. And then you go to complete shapes. And then the shapes are rendered into classes, whatever you think it is. Like, for example, this is a face. I think um, eyes, nose, ears. I didn't um, somewhere in my brain, in the path from my retina to my uh, occipital lobe, I registered edges, corners, and other features that coalesced and emerged from that. I recognize as a face. I also did classification on that. Probably some segmentation I'm not aware of. So um, all this happens really fast, and in the cat, actually, there's a video of them performing this experiment. You can actually listen to the activations of the neurons as they show them shine a light of an uh, of this edge on the wall, and they move it up back and forth. And every time it, it comes into the receptive field, you can hear the spiking of like a hiss in, uh, in the background from the cat's neurons firing, which is fascinating. I should link that video here. But um, so they showed, at least in um, in the biological sense that this occurs. Before this, there was really not really much research into convolutional networks because no one was doing it. Actually, uh, I think it was 
Hubble, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology on this paper. Um, and I'm not on the right screen, sorry. <laughs> um, so, going from there, how did this even inspire convolutional neural networks? Well, the AI in the 80s was basically a bunch of bespoke, extracted, well, not extracted, but engineered features. You had a lot of rules determining what can be a face. So you said, oh, this edge has to be here. This collection of pixels have to be in a certain fashion. So you have uh, feature experts sit down and actually write a bunch of rules. And you can see that will get out of hand as you try to move into more generalized um, models. Um, and not you write a, um, a bunch of rules for one face might not necessarily work for another face. So what really works really well in actually generalizing classification of faces and objects in the real world? Well, eyes, brain, occipital bulb. So why not base something off of this um, very complicated thing? Just get it down to a level where we can just use it, and even if it's simple. So it, Jan LeCun did not actually come up with convolutional neural networks. He didn't invent them or anything. Uh, before him, uh, there were guys like Jeffrey Hinton, and at Bell Labs there was Akira Zara, and they came up with the early, early, early version of a convolutional network called um, Neocognition. And from that, when Jan LeCun joined Bell Labs, he started developing Linet 1 and started refining that in the middle mid-80s. Back propagation was invented by Hinton, or rather was developed or um, refined by Hinton. That really sped along the um, research into Kumbh into this area. Um, by the time the late 90s came around, mm, convolutional neural networks, mostly Lynette, was doing a lot of the OCR um, uh, prediction in the US. Um, AI had its niche. It was OCR, that you can recognize digits, that was good. Banks love that kind of thing. So that brings us to basically what did they develop? What ideas did they have and how did they implement them? So as you can see, here we have a normal deep neural network. And this is a convolutional neural network. There are a few differences between them. Um, for example, let's take MNIST. You can train MNIST on either one of these. MNIST is a data set of handwritten digits. Every image is about 28 by 28 pixels. Um, the, the population that created them are mostly high school students um, and a few non-high school students, predominantly high school students. So normally how you would train it on this is that you would take the 28 by 28, make it a matrix and turn it into a robot. You'll have uh, a, 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 a one observation of 728 features. You would then assign one to run per feature you would have 728 in the first input layer. That's a massive amount of parameters, a massive amount of computation just for one image. And by the time you reach the second layer, that grows tremendously. That is a problem. So if you want to use deep neural networks, you have many um, hidden layers, you're going to be running out of compute by the time you reach anywhere near the middle of your, your um, architecture. So this is a big problem. So what do we do? We need to implement something that works on images specifically, if we can, or at least something in a grid-like topology. Um, doing convolutions specifically seem to work, and I'm going to go into that in just a moment. The basic, basic run-of-the-mill architecture is this. You have an input, you do a convolution, you do some activations, you pull it, um, you do some convolutions, more activations, you pull it again, you flatten it, and you run it through a normal, fully connected, deep neural network at the end to actually output your class predictions. So, in this network, very few parameters, loads of parameters, but this does all the big lifting right here. When you get to this part, you only have a few things left. It's a tremendous, still a large set of parameters here, but you've reduced the possible overall number of parameters a lot by the time you reach this point. And it's all thanks to the convolutions and the pooling layers. Without those, you couldn't achieve some of the groundbreaking 
classification error rates that we have on things like MNIST, which is a toy data set by this point, but other things like biomedical imaging. You can get a 94% um, classification accuracy on lung nodules. I mean, ca um, um, lung cancer nodules. You can get uh, actually higher than that. I think with the data science poll in 2017, the classification error was like 0.2, 0.3%. On um, I did it classifying lung cancer, um, you get and so you can use this for a lot of things, which I'm going to go into right now. So let's start off with the basic, basic, basic convolutions, convolutions all the way down. So what are we doing when we convolve things? In a, what is a convolutional layer? So, you can treat all these as convolutions. We're starting off very basic. We have a bunch of convolutions, that's all we have. So convolutions are working this way. First of all, you have the input image. Most images are, are in color, so you'll have three. It's actually a, not a 2D volume, it's a 3D volume. So you have red, green, blue, and it works on all three. Um, sometimes you'll work with medical images, and it'll only be one channel, which would mean it'd be just grayscale. It doesn't matter. Um, you'll have a convolution kernel. Um, usually, the uh, three by three because that's a good size to start off with. Um, then you will simply convolve the input image with the kernel. The kernel is also known as the um, filter. It's also known as the um, um, activation map. But basically, that's the first thing you do. So here we have we start with a twenty-eight by twenty-eight by. Three. That means it has a width of 28, height of 28, and it's RGB, so it has three, a depth of three. So we have a convolutional kernel, which isn't shown here, but I somehow messed up this thing here. This is a convolutional kernel size, three by three by two. That's that means it has a size of three by three, height and width, and it has two convolutional kernels. This is not realistic. You would never have just two kernels. You can have a lot more than that. There are rules of thumbs you can follow, but I, uh, you can have a lot more kernels than that. This is the number of kernels you're going to train. That means these are the number of kernels that it will learn to be able to extract lines, edges, circles, and more abstract features as it goes along. Um, there, I'm going to show you the math. This is pretty, somewhat simple, but it gets tricky when you include other objects like pooling, and it becomes frustrating when you have to actually build one from scratch, and you have to kind of look and keep track of this. <laughs> it could be, even though it's very simple math, it can be very frustrating to get these parameters correct. So, um, it's just a simple application. So you have width, height, and you have the parameters here, which is filter um, size. You have the number of kernels. You have the stride, and you have the padding. And I'm going to talk about those in a few slides. So you have those parameters, which are the parameters you set almost with every library you would use. If you're building one from scratch, you just set these parameters and you let it rip. But you have to do a little bit of math to see if these parameters are correct, unless it, your library detects it for you. That it, well, most of the time you'll know it's wrong when you get an error and it just breaks. Um, so you would take the, you would convolve this with the kernel of size three by three by two. Um, you will get the result of, four, of a 14 by 14 by 2 um, 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 output. Your next set of kernels, usually you would, this is kind of realistic to increase the number of kernels as you go along. You can keep them the same, but um, in the real world you'll see those increasing for every layer that you convolve. Um, so you do the same calculations. Again, you will come up with a 7 by 7 by 5. And what is happening? You start to see this kind of stretching out of the um, results, what is happening is that these can be considered neurons. Now, this slice here is one kernel. I mean, yes, one filter, sorry, one bank of filters. This is another filter. This is another filter. So I only technically trained two, so there all should be two here. What's happening is that um, as you train one neuron, well, if you can see this slice, you can pretend this slice is in the front, so all these neurons here have been trained for one kernel. And so this is another kernel, and all that, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth, until you get to the level of comment, or however many convolutions you want. You would, now, realistically, would never just chain a bunch of convolutions like this. We'll usually intersperse them with pooling and stuff like that. And 
implicit in this is a uh, ReLU activation. So these are being the neurons are being activated on certain parts of the image, the input. So after you get your bank of neurons, I mean, excuse me, bank of uh, weights here, your filters, and as it begins to lose its original spatial dimensions and so on and so forth, it very quickly loses its spatial dimensions depending on the features you choose. So I changed the features towards the end because you, it, 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 I'll, as you see the math later, I changed the padding to zero because it works out better that way. If I didn't, I would have get a, gotten a non-integer answer for the next layer's uh, height and width, and you can't have, well, you could if you accounted for it, but in simple, simple case, you want integer height and width uh, numbers. So let's get to the math. No, I don't have Maybe I want to clarify one thing. So yes. the first thing that you are doing is actually you saw that already it's filter band where you're filtering with multiple layers which are filters. You can define any shape to the filter mm -hmm. and then you're scanning with that filter all the image and convolve, right? And you get another image of the same kind. So the difference here is that you are not doing that sample by sample, you're not doing that pixel by pixel, you're jumping. Right? From here to the next place, yes. which is these are patches. Notable. And this is why the output image is smaller than the input image. The dimensions of output image generally smaller by something like you have initial image is 28 by 28 and output is 14 by 14. So you basically skip every second pixel when you jump with that mask. So you yeah. took every second pixel, every second row and every second column, right, when you convolve with that. Now, the interesting question here would be why is they are doing convolution and not correlation? I have the slide for that. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that is uh, interesting. Is actually cross correlation on the uh, forward path. So, yeah. So, um, let me just go over the parameters the filter size, the number of filters, the padding, and the stride. This, like he said, the input, the filter, usually you get a smaller image as a result. That's a problem. If you just do convolutions, you'll soon end up with one number, it's dot product. So you'll end up with just one number if you do enough convolutions. So one way to do that is have a parameter for zero padding. So you have, if you want the output to be roughly the same size as your input, you can zero pad it uh, and then run your kernel across it this way. So the problem, the original problem is that if you run this kernel across here, there are only a certain number of spaces that you can actually have the kernel that it, w it would overlap with all the stuff you want, the image itself. So if you want all of this to be considered when you create your output, you zero pad it. So when it goes across, it's actually taking into account every single um, element in this matrix. It, of course, discounts the zeros as dot product. It's going to discount the zeros. So that's one way to do it. Um, I usually don't see greater than um, one level of zero padding around it. This is just going up. You can add as much zero padding as you want. Um, but and that's usually the rule of thumb is just do zero padding, not to do like repeat the image in the corners. You just want the image and zeros around it. So you can increase the padding. And this is working out the math of the size of your layers in advance and seeing what will work and what will give you foobar. Um, so you have padding, however much padding you need. Then you have strides. The stride is how far you're going to move. You're going to move one pixel at a time. You can move two pixels at a time. You can move three pixels. You have to be do this within reason um, because sometimes more than a stride of two or a stride of three, you will break. It will not make any sense. I suggest you all go out and try to build a very basic convolutional neural network from scratch and just test working with all these parameters. Here is the math behind trying to um, behind the output. Once you do a convolution, how do you know what size is your output? You have the weight of the initial um, not initial weight. Initial width, initial height, you have the depth. The depth is not the depth of the network, it's the depth of your image. If you have red, green, and blue, that's the depth of three. The grayscale is one. Some instances you can have more than that. You can have a depth of two. It depends on your data. It depends on what you're inputting. So, given that you have an initial uh, image with uh, width, height, and depth, you have the K number of filters, size of filters. Um, since your filter should be a square filter, it's, uh, all you need to do is take into account its width or height by itself. Stride and your zero padding. So you have the input image, 
or the input to any layer that is going to be performing convolution, you, run, um, you perform this calculation, you get the size of your next layer. So this helps you plan out very well how to design your um, architecture from the get-go. And that is actually how I random, I just randomly started off, since I did a lot of work with MNIST, that was the first data set I did work on, I just started off with 28 by 28 by 3, even though it's not an RGB data set, it's just black and white, it's grayscale, so it usually it has one, but that's too simple. Now, if you're building a neural network from scratch, a convolutional neural network from scratch, and not using any libraries, then you probably want to, you might want to start off with just one channel. But yeah, you just do the calculations, 28 minus 3 was 5, 5, oh, I forgot my only equation. So, 20, 28 minus 3, we have 3 by 3 filters, so the filter size is 3, this gives you 5, we have, where's my padding? Maybe I should look at my number. Well, the padding was 1, so I keep it simple, and you divide by a stride of 2, so that is wrong, isn't it? Is that right? 25 divided by 2 will give me an odd number, which will give me an incorrect size. Okay. That's what happens when you do it on the back of a napkin. Um, I'll come back to that. I'll think about that. Why did I do that? Wrong? Okay. But it does work, and I've done plenty of C convolutional neural network architectures um, on it. It took a while to kind of get the intuition down. But we think trying to study back propagation through convolutional neural networks would be harder than trying to come up with what is the size of the next layer in your network. No, it's not. That propagation is relatively easy. Um, the sequence of com oh, so this is basically a summary of what we just went over. What a convolution is basically, you take your filter, whatever it is, you evolve it. You do a dot product. It's basically a dot product here. It's just going over the entire thing. And this is one filter as a result. Excuse me. One activation map as a result. There's no special thing going on. There's, uh, there's no zero padding. Uh, there's a stride of one. Um, the number of filter is one. Um, so the input image is only has one channel. And you're done. That is pretty so straightforward. Correlation convolution. Of course, I haven't had that. But yeah, they, they call it convolution when it's really cross correlation on the beginning because they they just want to keep generally the same um, naming convention. Now on the back propagation path, it is convolution. But generally, to keep everything simple and to have a nomenclature the same is basically. So we and also we use cross correlation instead of convolution because it's more computationally. Mm, is less computationally expensive. Convolution is somehow doing that flip causes too much computation. So there you go. Cross correlation on the forward path, back propagation, you do convolution. Oh, convolution. Okay. Uh, so what happened? Ah, oh, okay. Escape. Press escape just a little bit harder. Not like that. Okay, sorry. I didn't think so. Okay. Let's it's just line up. Okay. I just cut I just exit out of the presentation mode. There we go. So yeah, here we go. Here's convolution on uh, we can consider RGBs a seven by seven by three. It's originally a five by five by three. We did one layer of zero padding. Um, we have RGB, so we have these filters here, which are convolving over every channel. The result for the first filter bank is up here. The result for the second filter bank is here. And it's pretty straightforward. And of course, every convolution, every filter bank has a bias. But that usually doesn't play, that doesn't play any role in creating these activation maps here. So it's pretty straightforward. It's very, very easy math, it's not product. So, does anyone have any questions on this aspect of it? This is pretty straightforward. So, going back to the thing here. Okay. And I just should have went to the slide first. 
and you're used to. So. <laughs> so just to really give a recap is that to give more depth of what's happening with the filter map, and I know Dr. Matt is going to ask the question, how does it even learn the filters in the first place? Um, so this is kind of the result of um, running it through filter bank. So imagine on this one, we have the input image, it's going to be RGB. We decide our filter uh, bank size is going to be four. We're going to train four filters, or learn for four filters. So we initialize them. Dr. Not money, that's very important, but we'll go back to that in just a moment. So you initialize them, you train it, they do their comp so you get this activation maps as a result. This is basically the result of conv convolving each of these filters with that, so you get this feature map. So, you iterate. So, okay, here we go. As I just explained a moment ago, convolution of F and G continuously and discreetly is really what we see, just the, the differences here. We just do cross correlation. Now, why in the details do we do cross correlation? I really can't find information on that. It's like every time I look this up and try to say, oh, why did they insist? On cross correlation, all I get is the answer is like it's less computationally expensive. So all I have to do is go with that. Unfortunately, I I will add an addendum or an appendix on this if I can find more details on why why the cross correlation is used by people developing deep convolutional neural networks. Um, of course, this is only a uh, one dimensional. Um, version of it. If you want to do images, you start off with the two-dimensional version. Um, actually, it's more complicated than that. It should, it should add another one on there. It, it, to do this by hand is straightforward. Do you so, know if somebody tried to normalize cross-correlation? I haven't heard of that. Normalized cross-correlation? Yeah, I would bet that this should work better. Somebody could have happened when they built batch normalization. Right? So right. normalized cross correlation is just Pearson coefficient, right? right. It's just like between minus one and one, mm -hmm. which gets you basically fitting to the object. So it's object matching. Mm -hmm. So you have filter which is your object, and right. you're trying to match that object to some piece of the image. The That's difference true. between regular convolutional correlation is just that before you do the multiplication and dot product, mm -hmm. you reducing the average mm -hmm. of the patch, mm -hmm. each patch, and divide it by sigma. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, they used to have something called a normalization so, layer. I think that. So this is not a normalization layer. Not too. Not what? No. Okay. Um, okay. Could it be? So when you're doing convolution or correlation, you're just normalizing. You do just z-score if you will. Okay. From statistics, instead of multiplying point by point, because look, for very bright filter and very bright image will be like huge correlation, right? Mm -hmm. It will impose a lot of data around the bright point. Right. But if your information in somewhere in darker regions, it will not notice it. So it will basically impose constraints on what you can recognize. And mm -hmm. if you have an image something very bright, I would guess that those things will be involved in decisions much more than darker regions. Ah. So, with doing that normalization on your data before you even feed it yes. in. Yeah, that's what, yeah, we do that in data augmentation, we go ahead and normalize it. Um, but it's normalization per patch. Computer per, different Oh, yeah, adapted, okay. And you cannot normalize the entire image. Right. But right? you need just to take that space where you're taking convolution, patch behind that patch, right? And normalize both patches okay. and then multiply. If it's not the normalization layer, could, well, patch normalization is between Layers, so could it be batch normalization at this time? Uh, no. No. Okay. Well, so, computationally expensive, yes. Mm, yeah. But I believe it should work better. But I'm not sure. I think somebody tried. did it. There's a paper. Maybe about somebody it. did it. Yeah, there is a paper about it. It improves the deep learning, like when you do normalized cross correlation. It's normalized cross correlation? Yeah, it's improved. It. Okay. So, um, let's go into what is uh, happening under the hood with convolutional layers. Um, so, if you go back to a fully connected network, you have the notion that every neuron is connected to every neuron, and each neuron has its own vector of weights. That is computationally expensive. You have, you have parameter explosion. 
But with convolutional neural networks, the idea of receptive fields and patch and patches, we get something like this. So we have the input layer and we have the neuron and the kernel, and it is only this is a receptive field. It's looking only at this right here. So, um, it moves across this image, and every neuron has its own receptive field. The thing that makes it work is that not every neuron has its own vector of weights. For this particular filter, they're sharing weights because what it's looking for is something like edges or stuff like that. So if you have an image and you're looking for an edge, you don't have to redevelop the ability to look for an edge in every single neuron. You just simply say, okay, we're look well, it doesn't say anything. It's looking for an edge, so it shares that weight with the next um, uh, neuron. Okay, I'm looking for an edge. Next neuron, looking for an edge. No reason to retrain that ability to look for an edge. It reduces the cost significantly because as you add more filters, each filter can just share its weight among with the rest of the, um, well, as you more, add more neurons, each, uh, they have shared weights. They're looking at one receptor field and they're looking for features that, they're all looking for the same feature. So there's no reason to reinvent the wheel, basically. So instead of, if you looked at it this way, you would be reinventing the wheel several million times. Where here, it's significantly less. If you look at it uh, deeper into the network, uh, this is the input, this is first convolution, say this is the second convolution, the receptive field kind of becomes interesting. So this layer is, has a receptive field in this layer, and this layer had a receptive field here, so technically there's information about this here, because this overcomes the problem of, well, you have these sparse connections, that means you're not looking at everything. So if you go back, the, the more layers you add, the more the picture becomes clearer. I guess is a good way to put it. Um, this argues the point, well, you just add more layers. The more layers you get, the better. Actually, that's true. So when you think about receptive fields of sparse connectivity, the more layers you have, the actually, it's like taking a flashlight, being close to the wall, you have a very narrow cone. And as you go away, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Just imagine yourself stepping back layers and layers and layers. And of course, that analogy only goes so far. But you get the idea that the more layers you have, the, this, the, the uh, information about this layer is still existent in the layers, many layers down the road. So you can have something like ResNet that has 100 and something odd layers, but use, technically uses different methods, but, and still have a viable architecture. Um, as I mentioned before, they share weight. Here's another image. So you have your inputs. These are two different kernels being trained on the same image. And then you have your, uh, they have their own receptive fields. You train your own uh, filters here. This has information about this here because it's like a funnel. <clears throat> All neurons detect the same feature at different positions in an input image, which is true when you share your weights. And I, okay, I just recognize this is the old version of my program. All right. So we have learned a little bit about the convolutional layer, and which is the first little bit of uh, convolutional neural network, the most fundamental part, where it got its name. It have, it, the, um, the current state is that we're trying to move to less of these, which I'm going to talk about pooling layers, and more convolutions. The more convolutions you have, and the less pooling you have, is supposedly the best thing that you have. I don't know exactly the reason why. I'm still investigating that. Um, pooling is a really more simple than convolution. You have an input. This is usually after the, uh, the initial image has been cabal. You might have immediately following that a pooling layer. Basically, it always has a stride of two. You always want to go from an, um, an uh, um, um, patch size of two by two. And you always want to just jump to every patch and calculate the, uh, well, not calculate anything. Just pick the largest value there is one way to do it and just put it in the output. As you can see, it reduces the size significantly, usually by half. So, there's no padding. You don't need to zero pad this. And the only two features are um, the size of the filter and the stride. The stride is always the same because you always want it, you don't want to do a stride of one. There's no overlap here. You're just picking the highest value in the patch. 
There's another type of pooling, well, that's called max pooling. There's another type of pooling called average pooling, where you just average all the numbers here, put it here. That is less used, although in GoogleNet, there's an interesting use for that that has made uh, very good uh, results in recent um, ImageNet competition. Um, so, as you can see, pooling usually just reduces by half the amount of information you have. This is downside. You're throwing away about half of your information at the cost of spatial resolution. So, the more pooling you add, if you just have a string of pool, pooling uh, layers after your first convolution, your image will disappear and you will lose all spatial resolution. You'll ha you will know that there's something there, but you don't know where it is. It has, but what you lose in spatial resolution, you gain in translation invariance. Because it doesn't matter where the image was in the, where the object in the image was, it could be anywhere, it will recognize that it's an object there. It's, so it becomes translation invariant. I'm going to have to mention equi, equivariant. Do you, know, do you know if somebody tried the uh, EQ, IQR instead of MOX or uh, just mean in the quartile? Um, the only two that I've seen like written down. percent kind of out of statistical. No, I haven't seen anything I'm besides. Coming, I'm coming from, from a completely different perspective, right. from perspective of statistics. So maximum is great because maximum correlation means it's best match mm -hmm. to your page. Right. right? So, so your filter band provides some feature which is very, very close to what you actually see in the image. Mm -hmm. This is what maximum means, mm -hmm. right? But maximum is not very reliable. And this is not reliable for two reasons. Again, the first reason is because if it is very bright, it will give you very high right. correlation right. or convolution. And then it's misleading the entire thing. Second thing is uh, basically it might be noisy. It's just noise, like good fit, but by mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, you see something very similar, which is not really there. Mm -hmm. Okay, just noisy pixels cause the problem. Okay, now mean is not good. I mean, it's much more robust because right. you average on multiple numbers, so it's kind of average of the region of how close it is to that entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But mean mean means that if you will attract some additional layers of the same convolutional network, mm -hmm. I mean, if you do convolutions on the new layer. Mm -hmm. which is layer of those max poles, right? Those numbers will not be relating the information about hierarchy of the image itself. Why? Because right. it will not show you where the actual right. good fitting is. It will right. show you kind of average fitting, right. which is meaningless, technically right. speaking. Right. So it will create some structure which is amorphous kind of uh, image on which you again running convolution and hoping that the average number will give you some information on something. Right. So, Interquartile is a robust measure, mm -hmm. okay, and it's also like 75%, which is bigger than the mean. Right. Which means it will give a high number if your max is high, right? But it will not take the max, which is just the only pixel, which is like right. huge, and everything else is kind of low, right? Because you expect that max will be neighborhood of max. Right. Like a few points which are very high correlation or convolution, mm -hmm. and not like single point which is just noise point for some reason. So you are taking maybe neighborhood like three by three, right? And computing IQR, uh -huh. quartile right. range, and taking that seventy five percent number, right? Oh, okay. I haven't somebody, read somebody any, anybody to... doing that. I'll usually it's uh, average pooling or uh, max pooling, nice. yeah. um, and there and there's been uh, and they were moving away from. Um, average pooling until GoogleNet came around and they started implementing it in place of this fully connected uh, layers. Um, but I haven't heard of anything else besides those two. So clearly median is robust, much more robust than the mean, for example. Right. But again, it's not not saying what you want to say, right? So it's it's not saying like where is the best fit right. of the object, right? But if you're taking like 75% at least, it says like 75% is good fit. And this is a robust measure, it's not like noise, it's just, it's really good fit. It's for the entire neighborhood, like the entire neighborhood is good fit, right. up to 75%. And when you're doing convolution on the next layer, so 75% is still a big number if the overall is big, mm -hmm. right? Right. Hmm. 
could be that oh, maybe they're maybe doing just max and average because there's a very simple computation computation way to do. You know? Or you can use maybe uh, average of two best or three best, or mean median of uh, three best or something of that kind. Like pick the three the highest numbers in the in the mask mm -hmm. and do median of them, which will just throw all the highest one. Right. Okay, it will throw the lowest one and it will be somewhere in the middle between the highest ones. Similar kind of approach. Actually, makes a lot of sense. I, I'll try to find an answer for you on that and see why average and max pooling are the only things in town. Because that is very, very, very apropos. Um, oh, yes. To kind of um, demonstrate the what max, well, well, max pooling is doing. You have the image. Well, this is the features that it's going to highlight here. Max pooling. So, basically, shows how it down samples. It really gets small if you just do a string of them. And what happens as they go along? You can see with max pooling, you only get the these areas here where the activations were strongest. And same thing here. Same thing here. And so, but if you reduce the size of a feature map or the resolution of a feature map, you know. so what well, I meant to write up there is convolutional layers and pooling layers share weights across. Well, no, sorry, convolutional layers share weights across their separate fields, which is several slides ago. Here's another example of uh, pooling. And this is an example of a feature map of shared weights. Um, so we come to the end of the basic parts of a convolutional neural network, um, the result of which is that you can kind of alternate them, convolution, ReLU, and convolution. ReLU is a rectified linear unit. It's the activation used in this, although they've moved away from regular ReLU and gone to things like leaky ReLU and stuff like that. Um, so you would just do convolution, active, make, create your activation maps, another convolution, do another activation map, pull down sample, and this is, yeah, this is AlexNet. Uh, yeah, this is AlexNet, but without the two strings. So this is a top five choice, fully connected at the end, usually two fully connected, about 4,096 neurons each. Then you have, depending on, this is, it should be a thousand classes, so you have a thousand neurons at the end, uh, calculating um, a class score with a softmax activation. And you can output the feature maps at every layer. You cannot, I don't think you can output the filters at every layer, you can output their active feature maps. So this is the result of the first feature map. If I really, this is not very good image. So you can see these are high level, or rather low level, and then it kind of gets blurry. Is this right? Yeah, that's right. So it really, there because the reason that it cannot output some uh, uh, actual filters in the intermediate layers is that some filter banks, their output is nonsense to a human. So that's kind of the black box kind of thing. It's like the computer can understand what it's doing, in some areas, but in early in the early stages, you can see a lot of what's happening. And when you output just the activation maps, you can see, well, this here. I'm sure if I zoomed in, I'll see something very. This is not a very good image. Um, you can see actual features that the network is recognizing over the um, the um, over training. So, gosh, it looked better. Hmm. But, yeah, maybe that will work. A little bit. <laughs> but you can see that, oh, here's some, and it might do like, uh, a, like all the filters that we learned about early in the class, you might do a sub-L filter, you might invert the image, you might do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are a size ten filter bank. Um, and they kept it the same throughout the entire image, so um, unless this is just a sample over the top, I think. 
think this is how it's at, so it shouldn't be too many problems. But um, then we do a, a railroad which activates in certain areas. We did another, that means this is the same when it that shows railroad. That's the same as just doing the convolution operation on the uh, the input image and running it through the um, activation. So they're all wrapped up. That's why Rayla is not its own layer. It's wrapped up in convolution. So these two are the same thing. This is involving the output of that. And you can see something here, which I don't know exactly what it is anymore. But it, after you pass it through the fully connected layer, it is a car, as we can see. There's a person inside the car. Yes, it's not trained to recognize a person in this instance. Or rather, it's, one, it's not one of his top picks. If it was a car and then it had a person as the second thing, then I would be very impressed. That would be awesome. You could do that. You can train it to recognize uh, do, um, instance segmentation. All right. Um, so, oops, did I just skip something? Oh, no. Okay, that's not good. I see too much of what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, questions. I'm going to take questions now because it seems. This is an early, this is my original early version. Like, yes. Take a break. And, uh, is it time for a break? Well, uh, if you want to change your presentation. Um, I, I, it's, it's, lo it's locked down on the computer, isolated from the crowd, so <laughs> I can't do anything unless I go home. Oh. Well, now it's go home, I'll just come back in, or just redo the slides here. Okay, um, so questions mm -hmm. on any aspect of this that you need clarification on. I'm surprised William isn't here. I had a bunch of math on back propagation for him. Questions, come on. How many slides left? 45 dozen. Okay, no. Good. Actually, since I brought my version one of my slides, I have like five slides left. These actually last few slides, I was going to spend 15 minutes on each one because they're interesting, but I left all the math that I had is between this slide and this slide. There's math. Oh, there was back propagation has lots of math. But yeah, there is a lot of back propagation. Any questions on any aspects that you need to know more about? Yeah, the layers. How you can count how many layers you need for your right. That goes into the original when we were calculating the size of each of the output layers. It depends on your initial input image. Well, so uh, your pre-processing or your data augmentation. So let's say you have I I'm currently working on some CT scans. They're all 512 by 512 by roughly between 30 and 62. So that means they have an image size of 512 by 512. They're stacked up about 30 or 60 high. So they're three dimensional. I have to convert that to a 4D tensor. So the number of slices, the number of channels, it, this is depending on the library you're using. In MATLAB, I, I think it's using the normal way of uh, X, Y, and Z, or the number of uh, channels. So I, I start off with channels like number of samples, X and Y, so it's hard to, it depends on what you're using. So be aware of how it's, um, how it's fashioned. So you have the channels, well, sorry, samples, channels, X, Y, which is uncommon, actually. This is uncommon. It's mostly X, Y, number of channels, and number of samples. See, uh, Calm, right? Yeah, Pierce. Yeah. It's the different different. So yeah, this is this this is the one that's used most uh, like by default. Unless you if you're using something like Keras TensorFlow, you would have to go in and change it to use this. So um, your question was, how do you know how many layers? Yeah. So you take the basic math. You have to know what parameters you're going to use, and what you're going to do with your data. So you have a, a 512 by 512 um, um, <clears throat> CT scan, get CT scan. Let's say our normal scan is 30 by 512 by 512. Sorry, I'm used to using this way, so sorry if you're confused. Just ask me to clarify. So that's the number of, in this case, the number of samples, X and Y. So I'm just going to go ahead and convert that to what I actually feed the network. First of all, you have to determine how you're going to place your, your input into the system. So you have to design what's your input size. So is it going to be a 4D tensor or a, a three-dimensional whatever? So in my case, I have a uh, model that takes in a 4D tensor. 
because it's only looking at this part and I need to feed it slice at a time. It's not looking at the CT scan as a three-dimensional ball. It's looking at a bunch of 2D images. So anyway, so you say to your network, oh, I have an image of 512 by 512, but if, it, if you're going to use 512 by 512, you're, you might be running out of memory in your GPU. So your data augmentation step might be to resize this to something like 320 by 320. So, you'll save a lot of GPU memory, depending on what your GPU is. So, you, first, you have to know what you need to do with your data. Second, you need to know what kind of hardware you have. If you're using CPU or GPU. If you're using GPU, what kind of GPU? How much memory does it have? Like, um, the uh, Pascals on Chiha have about 13, 14 gigabytes of memory per GPU. I used to work on the K80s, which, are, which is a module with two K40s in it. It had about maybe 10. I had lung data. Now, head CT versus lung CT. So... There are a lot more lung than there is brain. So lung CTs are bigger. So I have 512 by 512 and whatever number of slices were long. It was too much information. It would crash the GPU. I had to figure out a special way to load it on the case. It loads on the Pascals a little bit better. So first you have to figure out what, how you're going to reach, if, if your data as it is, is good enough to fit on the GPU. After you figure that out, you need to find your first layer, which is your input layer. Convolution, usually. Technically, your first thing you're going to do is, uh, is a little bit more data augmentation. If you're going to do automatic or you're going to do it offline. So, data aug. Sorry, I'm drawing sideways. That's how I draw all my stuff. So, you do your convolution here, however, your input size is. Let's say it's 320 by 320. It takes a 40 tensor. Then you decide, okay, what is the most common method? Okay, if you're doing segmentation, here you go. I'm glad I came up with the signature. It shows me right here. This is called a fully connected. For the convolutional neural network, it is the, I call it the segmentation gun. So it looks like a gun, it shoots and predictions on pixel wise, predictions on the uh, mask. Anyway, so this is an early version of a uh, uh, convolutional neural network segmentator that came after the likes of AlexNet and is very good for its time, 2015, which is not long ago. So if you're trying to do something like segmentation, if, if that's what you want to do, it's the same segmentation, the same as classification, just classifying on every pixel. So, you determine your input image, you determine how you need to augment it to fit into your network, or what will work well for your um, hardware. Then, you decide that technique of alternating your convolutions and pulleys, just to figure how many times do you want to convolve it before you pull it. How many, and usually you pull it once. Convolve it, pull it once, convolve it, pull it again. You determine how you're fully connected would be at the end. You just, most of the time, you can just look it up, take someone's already implemented fully connected at the end, as, as long as the number of classes are, are um, this, well, if you're doing this, the number of classes, is, it really doesn't matter. Um, because you're doing segmentation and there's no fully connected at the end of this. It's just a mask. So, uh, pixel-wise prediction. So, in the case of the segmentation, you just have to worry about convolution, convolution pulling, 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 um, convolution pulling, and then you do your, and then uh, maybe another pulling at the end, or maybe the, I think this is a pulling. The way that it looks like the math is going, I forgot what these are. These are the size of, these are the number of neurons here. So I'll keep, I'm sorry, I'll keep thinking these are fully connected. These are not. So, let's see, 96. Oh, 96 by 256. And then 384 and then 384 and 256. And I think this is convolution pulling, convolution, convolution, pulling, pulling, pulling. Convolution pulling, pulling, I think. Because you want to get it really down, split down really small before you go up here. So, yeah. And this has a depth of 20. So that's right. Okay. So, you just have to pick that pattern or do a pre whatever your problem is. If it's already been done on a pre trained network, use that. And just retrain and hyper, um, do some tuning on it to work through your problem. So, what problem do you have? You want to do classification or segmentation? Or both? Fine. Classification. Classification. So you want to do something. Do we have classification on here? No, I only did segmentation. That's how I do segmentation all day long. 
So practically speaking, his question was how people invented uh, yeah, whatever the structures uh, or... Oh, or oh, I thought you said, how, what would I do to, if I needed to? No, okay. No, no. Well, so how, practically how, speaking, there is no answer to that. Yeah. Uh, besides yeah. starting from the... Because if I want to create my own, own kind of... Layers, oh, when you want to create your own art type of yeah, architecture, yeah. like... Okay. You, you try and error, okay. like you try and you pick... No. So, look, this is how it works in general. Broadly speaking, evolutional neural networks are basically hierarchical kind of networks. So, first of all, it picks up all kind of tiny, small, low-level features from yeah. the image. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what kind of features it will pick up, but generally yeah, speaking, it's like tiny blobs here and there, yeah. pieces of edges, all kind of uh, small, low-level kind of uh, imagery, okay? All kind of colors, uh, or blob-like features, okay? Now, next level combines those features into some semi-objects, like maybe finger, okay, or it might be just part of the body, or some other higher level hierarchical understanding of what happens. And then next level connects fingers to hands, okay, so it takes the entire hand as a single ball, uh, okay, and this is next layer, next convolution of your doing. And then that hand to arm, connecting to arm and body, so it's kind of uh, on the level of animal model, right? So this is something animal of human or even more things, right? And then it classifies to some more precise level, like this is human, for example, or this is cat, like one name for entire bunch of blobs and edges and other mm -hmm. stuff together. So more layers you put, basically more capacity of differentiating between different kind of detail levels you have. Okay. It's like number of detail levels on which detail level you want to go. Okay. Now, more layers you have, clearly it's more computationally expensive. Okay. Like if you have 100 layers, it's clearly you will work much, much, much longer and you will need to train uh, many more layers and you will need to use tons of GPU time okay. to train your network with many more examples because you need to adapt many more weights. Right? right now, with less layers, you don't need that many, like millions and millions of images to train your classifier. But you're missing something between the layers, between the details, like how much detail you want to get from smaller details, which are low level, to big hierarchical features like human, car, cat, and so on, which are kind of top level uh, features. So the layer mean features, like it's extract features. Layer it's extracting like. Parser layer extracting higher hierarchy features. Okay. Details, small details. First layer extracts very, very, very low level features, like color of the pixel, or part of the edge, like gradient, mm -hmm. or some, some computational low level feature, which you can compute by simple mathematical function of some kind on the image. Mm -hmm. Right? Next layer computes combined combination of those features together somehow. Right? And next layer combination of those combined features together. And next layer combination of previous layer combination. Right? Until you get to the level where you have single object or multiple objects in the entire image. Okay? Where you classify that as humans would classify it. Okay. Like what is that thing that you're looking at? Well, basically, if you want to just use convolutional neural networks and develop your own, um, type of architecture you first ask the question how many filters do you want? Um, how many filters is equivalent to how many features do you want to extract? So your first filter bank set of filters will extract low-level features. How many low-level features do you want to extract? Now there's no fast and hard rule on that actually it's mostly rule of thumb on how many filters you want. There's no, um, there are many articles out there, that, uh, many papers that really go into detail on trying to suss out um, what is a good number of features, you will, I mean filters, filter, what's the good size on the filter banks you want to have. Um, so what people do when they develop a new architecture who have robust knowledge in the area, um, they will take an architect, what has been done before and simply change that, for example, um, Google Net is based on a paper called Network and Network, which they took the notion of one by one convolutions. It's like, what's the point of one by one convolutions? It's like multiplication. It's mm -hmm. the point of that. 
But they found out that one by one convolutions is good for when you have a lot of filters and you want to keep that number the same, you would do one by one convolution. Actually, in their inception network, they <laughs> use a very neat trick is when they have an input, um, I hope I remember this. I think this is Inception version 3. So they do a one by one, and then they concatenate it into a filter bank. Then they do a three by three. Three by three and five by five combinations are also important. They concatenate it. Then they do a, I believe, another one by one. They concatenate it, and then they feed it into the next layer. And so they string all these together, and you get Google Net, which is the most recent version is 100. I mean, not 100, but uh, the one I mentioned earlier at the very beginning is uh, um, um, Google Net has 22 layers. Now, there are more versions since then, but yeah, they use something like oops, this, and they managed to in, in, um, do this and to get rid of the fully connected network at the end, which is they reduced them. Um, oh yeah, one thing. This has about several tens of millions of parameters. This has one million, I think, because they got rid of because most of the parameters are in the fully connected at the end. They got rid of fully connected and did average pooling. And because of their inception network. Now, they're, they're Google, and you would think they would have plenty of people who are really good at um, machine learning engineers, and this was version 3. Version 7 looks roughly the same. They did a lot more other uh, stuff. They got rid of, I think everything is replaced by one by one. <clears throat> so this is, I use this in my unit architecture when I'm segmenting um, hit CTs and stuff like that. It's very good at what it does. It's very well designed. Um, so when you want to design your own network, you start off with the basic principles like how many features you want to extract, how many features are there possible to extract, or better question, how many useful features are there to extract. And there are people like Jeffrey Hinton who are trying to come up with better ways to do this. So you, I told you they're trying to get rid of pooling um, the, um, operations. Uh, Mr. Hinton is trying to get rid of convolution, actually. <laughs> actually, he says it's no longer useful. But quickly, before I jump into that, that my, is on, uh, they're fully connected. Did I finish talking about fully connected? So, this was the first one. Um, there was a um, detail that actually, this is the next one. This is an expansion of fully connected. It's called a UNIT. As, you, it, as if anyone who was here last week, he mentioned UNIT is where you probably want to start when you're trying to learn uh, about convolutional neural networks. I would say I basically started here. Um, I use this for all my um, segmentation, no matter what it is. This is usually in the workflow, there's data augmentation, then there's this, and then there's whatever else. If I'm trying to detect stroke, cancer, or whatever, it comes after this. This is the, uh, this is a skull stripper. This is the long segmentator. The, uh, because one thing that you have, uh, a lot of these biomedical image um, uh, 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 workflows need is a lot of segmentation. So this is very good at what it does. It made a very good appearance in uh, the Data Science Bowl 2017 for lung segmentation. Um, there's another one called 3D Unit, which takes uh, entire volumes and does, instead of doing a 2D patch, it does a 3D patch. And it's very hard to do. 